Good morning. Hello. First of all, I um, very much like to thank uh, Jan and Heather for inviting me to this wonderful conference. Um, I, I really like this idea of the intersection of academia and uh, practitioners, especially because I am on one hand, I'm, I'm a professor at University of New South Wales, but um, I've also spent the la a significant fraction of the last two years um, as a software developer. So I'm kind of split personality. And uh, for those of you who know me, you may expect me to talk about Haskell, but I have to disappoint you. No monads today. Let's talk about Swift. Swift is not just an interesting, clever language design, but it's especially interesting if you look at its ecosystem. Um, in fact, there have been other hybrid uh, object-oriented and functional programming languages, as you know, a few of them actually. Um, but what's different uh, in the case of Swift is uh, not that it, as those other languages, nicely interoperates with the main language on the platforms it runs on and its libraries, um, but all these languages like Scala and F Sharp, they, they are um, a minor player on the platform, whereas Swift is said to replace Objective-C. And that presents um, a unique opportunity because why do languages become popular? We as language designers, we, we like to think it's the languages, but that's not true. It's the platforms. It's the proliferation of the platforms which make languages popular. And so Swift is going um, to dethrone Objective-C um, by decree, and um, it will become a mainstream language that's at this point inevitable, as it will be the major language on the um, Apple platforms. And since e, um, the, it's there's a distribution for Linux now, and Apple has a very strong push into education. Um, for example, in their last developer conference, they released um, a preview version of um, an iPad app, uh, Swift Playgrounds, which is squarely aimed at the education space, in fact, at teaching kids to code um, in middle school and high school. Um, it, it is set. Um, the, 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 the trajectory of Swift is set. So why is that interesting? Why should we care about this? Just another language which is going to be, get big. Well, it's interesting because the improvements of Swift over Objective-C are based mostly to facilitate functional programming, in fact, type functional programming. So in summary, what we'll get is um, a language which encourages type functional programming um, in a mainstream language. I found that quite exciting when um, Apple announced the language two years ago at their developer conference, and I was in the process of writing, um, or I just actually started writing an IDE for Haskell supporting live programming using playgrounds, and I decided to jump in and, and to just write it in Swift. And, um, it was one of the first Swift applications on the Mac App Store, I believe, and um, that's been very interesting. So let's get back to this. this. This is the core point. Swift encourages type functional programming in what will be a mainstream language, what arguably already is and will be um, one of the big languages. So types. Why are types important? Well, the conventional wisdom is types are there, to catch bugs and prevent crashes. Or you could look at it from a different angle and say, well, you have to do less testing. You can get the same confidence in your code um, with fewer and simpler tests. Why is that? Well, if you look at your application, at the state space of your application, then there are some error states. Those are the states which lead to a crash or undesired behavior. And then we test for some of those. What the type system does 
it reduces the amounts of states the application can get into in the first place, which, yeah, it eliminates some bugs, but it also eliminates the need for some of the tests. But if that's the whole story, are types just an elaborate form of restraint for programmers, um, something we shackle ourselves with to not fall across some obstacles? Um, and, and what if that doesn't work? What if you're one of these people who says the type system really doesn't do anything for me because that's not the kind of bugs I'm making. I'm sure you've all heard this or said this yourself. Well, actually, the main thing about types is that they are a design tool. First and foremost, they are a design tool. They encode static they are a language to talk about programs, specifically the static properties of a program, which is those properties which can be inferred and checked without actually running the program. But they are a guide. They help with code design, and then they um, automatically check the consistency of that design. So <clears throat> in fact, actually, types are a design tool for language designers and then the resulting language allows you to use it as a design tool for your programs. And that's the important thing. That's, the, 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 that's something the Swift team um, deeply understands. And one way to remind us of this is to follow this mantra um, often espoused by Yaron Minsky um, to make undesirable states in your application unrepresentable. But Let's get back to Swift. So Swift um, encourages type functional programming in a mainstream language. Um, that's my main claim here. So let me, and if, if the type system is a design tool, then, well, let's talk about how we can use um, types to help us design programs. So I want to specifically focus on two particular features of, um, of Swift, namely value types and something called protocols with associated types. Sounds a bit scary. Um, but to make this more concrete, I actually want to do this in the context of a concrete application, a little iPhone application. It's not very polished graphically. Um, the, what the application does, it's a tracker for personal goals, like how often uh, do you do this or that activity, which you really want to do more often, uh, to keep track of that. And that application, it's got two modes. So on one hand, there's this overview mode, where you see your, your progress so far, and, and you can register that you did one of those activities you want to do. And then um, there's the editing mode, where you got an overview of all the goals you've defined and you can change them um, and you can add or delete new goals and move them around. So that's a simple application. Let's have a look at how value types and these protocols um, help us to improve the design of this application and in, in, in particular to, to use uh, a functional programming approach. As we learned in the last talk, actually I think functional programming is, um, is, is great in this context because um, of this focus of small narratives. Functional programming is all about local reasoning, very local and small. So. <clears throat> Value types. What's a value type? Well, in Swift, there are two different kinds of value types. There are structs and there are enums. And you may think, well, you've got structs and enums in C. Well, that's how Swift, um, like typical Apple marketing, is very good at making things sound familiar. So they are non-scary. So they never talk about functional programming, they never use that term. They call things by familiar names and, and extend the functionality. So structs and enums in Swift, they are actually much more. So enums, as you can see in the second example, they are not just different alternatives, but each alternative can have um, uh, uh, values associated with those alternatives. And um, they can be parameterized. 
and they can be recursive and there's pattern matching. So um, as a Haskell programmer, I actually call this an algebraic data type. But then everybody runs away. So Apple calls it structs and enums and people are happy. But what's important about these value types is when we contrast them with reference types. So if I define a class uh, ref point for reference point um, and then I create an instance of that, so I get that allocated on the heap and my variable points to it. If I assign it to a different variable, well, of course, I only copy the pointer, and then changing through this pointer, I, of course, um, affect what's accessible through the first variable as well. You all know that. The big difference with value types is if I do the same thing, um, then I get an instance, but once I assign it, well, I make a copy. And then changing that obviously does not change the value referred to by the first uh, variable. So I get an immutable structure. Whether that structure is actually copied or not is irrelevant. The compiler tries to avoid copying, of course, but that's what's happening semantically. So that's great because that gets us to our um, postmodern goal of small narratives of local reasoning. It allows us to focus um, attention on a small piece of the code. We don't have to look at everything at once and consider impact of changes throughout the entire program. So I promised you to use these ideas in this iPhone application. We will do this by um, using something called an immutable model. So um, those of you who have written UE applications, uh, probably most of you, those of you who have written Cocoa or Cocoa Touch applications will be very familiar with the model view controller pattern, which is um, the way to structure a Cocoa Touch application. Um, or maybe if you're living in Microsoft land, you, um, you're using uh, the slightly more sophisticated model view view model um, architecture. But in any case, you've got those model objects where the data of your application is stored and, and where you retrieve information for presentation. But these models, they're usually, they're called model objects for a reason. They're objects um, with pointers to them. And when you pass them around, then you pass the pointers around, which means other objects such as those controllers or views um, often tend to accidentally change things in the model or they change um, data in the model in an inconsistent manner. For example, because they're running on multiple threads, which is basically a necessity in modern uh, mobile applications where you have to have a very fast responsive UI. So anything which could take a little longer has to go on a different thread. So using value types in Swift, we can avoid this problem. We just use a structure and enums to define the model. So in our concrete application, um, that would like like this. We've got a struct, and it's got a few fields. And then um, one of these struct instances represents one particular goal. And um, to track the progress of goal, we pair it. This is um, Swift's notation for, for pairs or tuples, so in this case, a pair. Um, where you can use um, uh, names uh, to identify the different components of a tuple um, to pair a goal with the progress you made towards the goal, and then we take an array of those um, to get the entire model state of the simple application. So by doing this, um, we can pass this around now, and we don't have to worry about any accidental changes because, well, it's a value type. It's not a reference type. So what we get, we avoid accidental changes to um, the model state, which gets rid of quite a few tests. And um, we make the whole thing uh, much safer in the presence of concurrency, which, as I said, is really um, a given in, in any um, modern mobile application. So that's number one. At this point, you may wonder, that's all great. Really, sometimes you want to change the model. How do you do that? It'll, that'll come later. You'll have to wait a moment, but I will tell you. 
All right, so number two, we've used struts. Let's try to use enums. Well, as I explained, this application has two main modes. Um, on one hand, there's the overview mode, um, and then we can uh, also edit the set of goals. Now, in the edit screen, um, as it's quite common in, in these types of applications, uh, there's a modal behavior. Uh, there's this edit, I, I don't know whether, you can probably not read it in, um, on those screenshots, but on the top right corner, there's a blue blob. It says edit. If you tap that um, on the left screen, you go to the right screen. And then you can delete goals, you can uh, move them around, and so on. So this is a modal interface, quite common. And the trouble with it, with this type of setup, is that very often in the different modes, there's different types of state you want to keep track of, which typically means that you've got uh, a few um, uh, variables, which may be nil or not, depending on in which mode you are. And whenever you transition from one mode to another, you have to make sure to change everything consistently. Otherwise, you get into this typical situation where you, your UI shows one thing, but you can't do the things you want to do, or um, there's an inconsistency um, in the state of the application. And that's quite common in, in uh, this type of mobile UIs. So using enums, um, we can solve that by um, understanding that really what we're dealing with is just um, a state transition system, right? So there are various modal states the, the one screen can take, and we can draw nice diagrams with uh, different states, arrows between them, and then we can define an enum for the different states. In this very simple application, it's just two different states. There's the display state and the editing state. And using those associated values, or uh, I would call them arguments on a subtype, um, we can, can associate those parts of the states which are relevant for that particular mode with that state, which means in the editing state, we always have active goals. In the display state, we cannot have them. There is not uh, a null, uh, uh, an empty list or a null pointer to a list of goals. Uh, they are just not accessible, and that's something the compiler can check. So when we use those, uh, such an enum in this simple setup, um, we can um, extract the first line, extracts using a map function, extracts out of the array of goals, um, the activity, whether um, a goal is active or not, and um, then wraps it into this uh, editing um, case of the enum. And um, in switch, we do pattern matching, in, in Swift, we do pattern matching using a Swift state, which is statement, which is a generalization of um, C Swift, but it's really just like a case statement in Haskell, only with weird syntax. Uh, where we can pattern match on the component, extract the state components, but we can only get at the active goals if we are in the editing state. And it's something the compiler checks for us. Um, so again, we, we lose some tests because there are a lot of inconsistent states which, which we cannot get into, which are not representable anymore. And moreover, the compiler can also check that our tra state transitions are exhaustive as if in a switch statement fee we forget a few of those states, well, that's hardly a problem in this simple application with two states, but once you get to something bigger, obviously um, that can help more easily. Um, the compiler will warn us about this oversight as well. All right, so this is how we can use value types or algeb immutable algebraic data types if you're a Haskell programmer or an ML programmer. Um, how you can use them to um, improve the design and type safety of your application. All right, let's go on to something more sophisticated or complicated, protocols. So if you're a Haskell programmer, then protocols are just type classes, and associated types are associated types. If you're a C++ programmer, well, it's a bit like mm, templates with traits. Uh, anyway. <coughs> I earlier mentioned we kind of 
maneuvered ourselves into a corner. We made the model immutable. So now we can't accidentally change it. Well, actually, we can't change it, which is a problem because our user may want to change it. But, but what's um, mutation anyway? Let's look at a variable, a simple integer, which when we initialize it, it's 25. Then we update it, we update it again, we update it once more, and then we update it to 42. This happens at different times, so one different way to look at this is to say, well, it's not just a mutating variable. This is a time series, right? It's one value strung out over time, or we could say it's a function over time to integers, or we could regard it as an unbound stream of values instead of something which mutates. Well, this is the idea behind a, a lot of these functional reactive programming libraries or the way uh, the ELM language um, operates. Um, but the point is, what we can achieve with this setup is to make the flow of change in our code explicit. It's no longer a side effect through a pointer, but we can actually, um, uh, uh, we actually have a handle at it and we know where change happens. And, and which parts of the code are affected by a particular change. Moreover, um, a nice side effect when, well, <laughs> a nice um, benefit is that uh, once we regard change as a stream of values, well, it's a collection. And we can apply all our uh, beloved uh, collection operators like maps, uh, filters, folds, and so forth um, to make change propagation and um, manipulating changes even more, uh, uh, even more compact and easier to understand. So how can we do this in, in Swift? Well, we could use one of these FRP libraries, which, okay, but actually this is a simple concept and we can just um, implement it ourselves. So we start by this defining protocol of observable values. Um, again, if you're familiar with Haskell, think type class. Um, if you're familiar with Objective-C, think protocol. And, um, but these protocols, they have an associated type. So the protocol we are defining is the class of types which we can be observed. But that's not necessarily the same type as the values which we are observing. That is the observed value which is implied by the um, type of ob observables. Um, that difference will become clearer when we use that protocol, but it's important to keep in mind two different types uh, in play here. And that protocol requires one function or, or one method, if you like. And that's uh, a method observe which registers an observer, and an observer is just a, a function. Um, in this red box, it's um, a callback, if you like, which is being invoked every time and um, there's a new observation or the value changes, um, the observed value changes. So based on this protocol, um, we have got two instances of that protocol. The first one is a stream of ephemeral changes, um, a class, a parametric class called changing um, of a particular parameterized by the type of values um, which we are observing. So the type of values in that stream would be in in our previous example with that mutating variable. So that class obviously implements the observe method because otherwise it wouldn't be uh, um, conforming to that protocol, but introduce one more method called announce, which um, we use to, um, to affect the change or to announce the presence of, of a change in that value. So that's our replacement for an assignment, if you like. Now, that's one stream. In this case, when you register an observer, you will be notified of all the changes which happen after you've registered. But that's not always enough. So we've got a second form of um, 
observable values. Um, you don't have to read all this code, uh, which is maybe a bit confusing if you're not used to Swift's uh, somewhat slightly verbose syntax. Um, the important thing is that when we create one of these accumulating values, then we provide an accumulator function, the thing in red. The accumulator function's purpose is that given a stream of changes, the accumulator consumes those changes, maintaining some local state which is updated or accumulated every time we get a new change value, producing a stream of these accumulated values. And on registration of an observer, the observer is immediately notified of the current value of the accumulator. So on the, these are the two forms of observables which we need in this uh, little application. Um, but based on this protocol, we can define a few collective operations. We can have a map function. Um, map on an observable passes in a function which is applied to every value in the stream and gives us a new stream. Merge takes two streams and merges them into one stream containing uh, the changes in both of these original streams. The streams can have different types. And then finally, an um, accumulate function which um, uh, given a, a, a stream of changes, produces one of these accumulating values which we saw on the previous slide. So now, with that at our disposal, which is really just a few lines of Swift, um, we can implement the change propagation in, in the simple iPhone application. So we start by um, uh, the model, which is this array of pairs of goals and progress counts. So the idea here in this table is G0, 1, and 2 are the goal structures, and uh, the numbers to the right of them are the change counts, which are the, the progress we've made to achieving uh, those particular goals. Now, we register two observers on that, one for each of the different modes of the application, um, the overview screen or the editing screen, and then um, those, both of these screens um, affect change because uh, in the overview screen, we can indicate that we've made progress towards a goal. Well, that's for the right um, column of the table. And then in the um, view on the uh, uh, lower part of the slide, the editing view, we can change goals. So that affects the left column in that table. So two different types of change, and we don't want, what we want to achieve here is that the screen, um, overview screen, can't accidentally modify the goals. And the goal editing screen can't accidentally modify our progress counts. So we achieve that by having two different sets of um, change uh, information, which are th then merged together. And these two different streams of changes, they are of different types. So the overview screen um, generates a stream of changes to progress, and the goal editing screen generates a stream of changes of edits to goals, different types. We can't mix them accidentally. M they are merged by the merge combinator, combinator, and um, into a stream of overall edits, which we then accumulate to um, get the table as an accumulating uh, observable value. So with this, this diagram translates very directly into the Swift code we are using to implement this, um, just putting the various functions at the arrow, uh, arrows in this diagram um, together. And um, it makes it very explicit and um, checkable to the compiler how, how it change propagates in this application. But the point I, I made in the beginning is this is not something which we've retrofitted. It is the manner in which we designed this uh, application which allows us to get that um, understanding as a human in the design process, but also allow the compiler to uh, check the consistency of our design. 
So what we achieve um, by this setup is that um, parts of the views uh, controller architecture of our application um, can't accidentally change those parts of the model they're not supposed to change. And we avoid conflicting state changes, for example, um, due to concurrent threads, um, which are sequentialized, for example, by this use of uh, streams of changes. So <clears throat> to summarize, overall, um, please keep in mind types are not um, a form of restraint to shackle you to your computer. First and foremost, they're design tool. And, and Swift is itself designed with those ideas in mind to encourage type functional programming and um, those allow you to replace entire categories of tests. Thank you very much. Hey there. Hey. Um, so I come from the other side, uh, from the Android world, and I just want to say that there is a very small few of us that are trying to, ap to apply this same approach into the Android world with uh, the help of the um, reactive <coughs> extensions in this case, or functional reactive programming. And I just wanted to say first as a comment, even though we don't have um, algebraic data types uh, as a first class element in Java, they can be encoded, they <coughs> can be created, because I, I've done it, I have a library that is called Sealed Unions that does exactly that for the um, JVM 8 and 7. So you don't need, um, you don't need any kind of um, pattern matching because you can do it with higher order functions using charge encoding. Um, my question is, um, the, the good part about the design is that when you're using it in your view model internally in memory, it works really great, but it kind of diffuses a little bit when you get into the edges because the type system is not as powerful when you're going into the network, when you're sending information, maybe in protocol buffers or any kind, or when you go into the databases because they don't allow those types. How do you bridge that persistence that you're supposed to be having for the model in over time in those databases or in those network holes? So the, the, that's, uh, so the, the point here was that um, in, a, in a typical application, uh, the model, uh, information, of course, is not something which is just created in the application, stays there until the application dies, but you have to communicate over the network or make the data persistent by storing in database or something like that. So, um, yes, um, so the interfaces are still the same. Um, for, uh, for example, um, if you use something like core data uh, on an iOS application to make your state persistent, then um, it's uh, totally possible to wrap those mutable APIs in a way that you get um, uh, an immutable view on them. And you mentioned React. I mean, React is doing exactly that, right? You've got the mutable DOM underneath in the browser, but the API which you present to the programmer, to the application programmer, is one um, of a functional description and of uh, functional updates. So basically, uh, you can use those same techniques here, um, only um, that, well, either you've got a library uh, or a framework which does that for you already, so some of those existing FRP systems try to do that for you, or it's something where you do the wrapping yourself, then uh, the person who you present this nicer interface is you in a different part of your application instead of some other person. Um, but it's the same idea. My, my question was a little bit more related about how you ex how do you express those types inside the database? Not how you communicate with it, with those interfaces. What I mean is that you cannot store in a database an algebraic break data type. You cannot store a, an either type. You cannot store a maybe, because the, the mm. duality of them is not be, uh, it's not easy to represent on a database or on a JSON schema, or the server has to know about it. So how do you approach those problems? You, you have to ser serialize them. Um, so, of course, you don't get the same um, expressiveness of te types, um, say, in, in an SQL database. So you, you serialize your um, model into something simpler, and um, which means that during 
um, deserialization from the database or from information which comes off the network, you will have dynamic checks. Thank you. So let me ask a question which I forgot to ask in the beginning. Who has used Swift at all? Who has used Swift in production? Okay. <laughs> Try it. Good morning. Hello. First of all, I um, very much like to thank uh, Jan and Heather for inviting me to this wonderful conference. Um, I, I really like this idea of the intersection of academia and uh, practitioners, especially because I am on one hand, I'm, I'm a professor at University of New South Wales, but um, I've also spent the la a significant fraction of the last two years um, as a software developer. So I'm kind of split personality. And uh, for those of you who know me, you may expect me to talk about Haskell, but I have to disappoint you. No monads today. Let's talk about 